Well, thanks for the organizers for inviting us um, today. And um, yeah, the title is a little bit um, referring, of course, to the uh, system of curated and expedient technologies that Louis Binford had been developing since about the 1973, um, mainly based on completely other material like Mousterian and ethno-archaeological material. Um, what, um, and what he wanted to look at was especially the inter-assemblage um, differences in how they develop over time and in uh, specific places. Uh, what we thought was also relevant in this part is that he also mentioned that within a group, so within a site, within a group, there are also differences in how much we care and, and take care of our material, the personal gear, um, will be, for example, for hunting, you want it to be working at the moment you're hunting, so therefore it's very likely that this is very well curated, whereas, for example, um, uh, while you're taking an animal apart, it can also be that you ad hoc do something just like, ah, oh, this, this cutting knife is not sharp anymore, I just make a new one. Um, so, um, basically what this concept says that, do we have a pointer? No. Okay. Um, that uh, in the curated concept is this concept of taking care of your, your gear and your material, um, preparing how to work with it, meaning, for example, that you look for specific raw materials and you collect that first to do something specifically. Um, when you're napping your lithics, for example, you, you do some preparation so that the outcome is really as you wish it to be. Um, and what follows from this is also that you have a certain standardization of how you do things, how you do your, how you do prepare your material. Um, but, of course, this also says that you have a very high investment and a high cost in keeping your gear in a good shape if you always, for example, have to look for the specific raw material to do something. Um, so what you will, we will see is a high inter difference, uh, difference um, which is also depending on function, standardization of uh, lithic tools, for example. Um, so the material we find is highly distinct and hence um, easily identifiable in the archaeological record. So for instance, um, if you look at um, the Havelte point, which, you're, no, you're not talking about this later, do you? Um, if you s find one, you usually know it's one because it's really nicely made, whereas a Feder Messer is a highly discussed topic, at least with us in, in Schleswig, what that is. Uh, in contrast, the expedient concept is that, you know, you use what you have at hand, you're more like flexible using, flexible using your surroundings and preparing your material, um, meaning also that you can uh, go into different areas um, knowing them, or you can only go into different areas when you know them quite well. Um, so your knowledge is actually quite high, but the, the investment at the place is re relatively low to keep your gear. Um, and it also, the um, inter-assemblage difference is rather low, so you can't really say, to say what an assemblage was used for and what it was not used for. Um, so this is actually difficult for us archaeologically to classify if we find something. So what we archaeologists want is the curated concept because then we can make differences in our typologies and everything. Um, but what Vaquero and uh, Romagnoli have just very recently summarized this discussion about expedient and curated, and they focus especially on the ex expedient part, and they said like, well, you see, in archaeology, we we'll unfortunately have quite a lot of those, and um, so using those to distinct uh, between groups, transitions, and so on, is actually very difficult. But this is exactly the problem we do have, and, um, uh, Schleswig and Kiel, we are, have a collaborative research center that focuses on transformations, scales of transformations. How do they work? How do they go? Um, and um, in particular, we are, whoop, that was too quick. Um, uh, we, as so the, the group of authors I represent here, um, look at the transitions from the Paleolithic to the Mesolithic um, uh, in northern Germany, and so the Arensbergian, that is, uh, to the Maulamosian. Um, and what we already see uh, when we look at the, the, the sites that we do have, the dated sites, very few because we have hardly any organic preservation. Um, you can see whoop, here, uh, this uh, gray line is the, um, 
as this high peak going up, the beginning of the preboreal, uh, the distinction between Pleistocene Holocene. But um, this red one here, that's the PBO. And what you clearly see is that the Paleolithic si uh, sites are on the one side of the PBO, whereas the Mesolithic sites only start after that in northern Germany. So our, in our sites, it's clearly that not the Pleistocene Holocene um, turn is also the turn of the sites and, and of the um, Paleolithic to the Mesolithic. Um, so, but what happens in this whole longer time stretch um, is if we look at, for example, the environment, um, this is about how Europe looked during the Younger Dryas. So you see that in the Baltic, we had um, a rather brackish um, sea that was fed, uh, uh, unfortunately, the red uh, frame is rounded, but fed through the belt areas. There were uh, connections to the mainland. Um, and uh, it was more an open park tundra environment in our areas where specifically reindeer was roaming, but also other tundra um, um, fauna. But in the south, we see the um, younger dry is not that bad. You still have very warm, loving fauna, faunas there. Uh, then when we move on to the early preboreal, the um, connection due to uplift um, in the belt areas uh, goes down again. And in the north, the ice sheet still covers it. So then we have the development of a um, sweet water basin in the Baltics. Um, not that much water towards the north where we are. Um, and the warmer fauna like elk is coming, which is still not a perfectly warm, but a warmer, more temperate fauna. And um, also we see that uh, in the uh, paleontological data that uh, we have in a, quite a quick increase in, for example, um, birch forests in the beginning. Um, we go f a little bit further on now. Actually, the, I have to say the map and the, uh, the animals do not perfectly match. So this is the second part of the um, preboreal uh, when the Sweetwater Lake breaks through in the north again and has a connection to the World Sea again. Um, but the animals are rather even further towards the Atlantic time. That's when we all already can see that a completely temperate fauna, including something like roe deer, comes up to the north. So there are kind of real environmental changes which are kind of connected to um, the temperature um, course or the, the climate developments. But um, yeah, how does actually the archaeology evolve? How do humans react to it? And um, we have here put in some, uh, a nice photo of one of the largest giant blades, as we call them rather than long blades. Um, we have here, um, and these um, kinds of concepts to decor, actually, a core to prepare it to make nice long blades. But before I have with these very, very giant, so they are really, you have to think, um, they are that wide. So it's not like a little wider blade. No, 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 no. they are wide like that and th long like that. They are huge. Uh, but they are just for decoring the, the core and preparing it for doing getting longer blades. This is spread over a relatively long area. So this is not just in northern Germany, where we have it, where we have a good raw material. Also, like for example, in the Somme Basin, where you also have a good quality of raw material available. We have that there. Um, we took another very iconic kind of thing that is more considered for the Mesolithic, which is the Duvensee bone point. And you see the um, area where this is found actually quite in most parts very nicely matches and also shows you that in northern Germany we have the exact overlap here. And also time-wise, you see for the dating, we have a considerable over overlap of these two technologies coming there. So we thought like, okay, maybe we, we should pre prepare or, or compare um, the assemblages of the Arensbergian and the Mesolithic that we do have in a little bit more details. For example, uh, we compared two sites, um, that was Tautwisch Mitte, which is an Arensbergian site, so the red is Arensbergian, and the blue is Friesack 27 in um, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern or Brandenburg, I'm sorry, east, northeast of eastern Germany, and um, uh, with, yeah, uh, it's an early Mesolithic site there, 
And we just compared here the length and width of blades, something very simple, but at least something where we had a lot of data already recorded. And what you see is that, um, in general, the, um, um, the uh, mesolithic material is a little bit shorter and more sturdy than the longer um, uh, Ahrensbergian material. Um, but this is, can be relatively easily explained due to the raw material sources that are available in Friesack and those that are available in Teltwich, uh, in yeah, Teltwich, the Ahrensberg Tunnel Valley, which is considerably better. And then we compared in, to that the, the angle of the butt <coughs> that was basically the, the, the angle where it was napped and um, found that um, even though it looks a bit strange here now, um, that is due to the different recording styles. This is something we will probably also discuss a little bit tomorrow in the um, PAM discussion session about lithic um, analysis because, yeah, we need some standardization. These differences that, you know, the um, mean, that the one box is on the top of the mean, that's ma mainly due to the recording system. But um, you see, so this is Teltwisch and that is Friesack. And actually the mean of Teltwisch is at the lower bottom. So what you actually see there is that they are identical. If you look at the exact mean, they are really almost identical. So there seems to be no difference in this napping style. And also if you uh, use a PCA, uh, um, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, for the, the napping attributes, um, what you can see there is um, nicely a distinction between um, the, uh, the red, the um, Ahrensbergian, and the blue, the um, Teltwisch, uh, the, the, the Mesolithic Friesack side. And it looks like, oh yeah, there, there is a real difference. But if you take out length that I had shown before in the, the plates that this is actually a difference, well, it looks like on the top. And yeah, you basically see no difference. They are very similar, they are very variable all over. And that was just two sites that we compared where we had the data. Uh, Inga Marie did a wider study. She, she had some more um, assemblages and fa also found that the concept of blade production is something that is very, very um, constant uh, between the early younger dryers, the younger dryers, the pre-boreal into the boreal actually, almost. Um, and that there are only more like slight and um, smaller changes happening. Um, she concluded that um, the change at the paleo-meso transition um, is likely not to represent an adaptation change, but a gradual change over time and transformation of the production cycle. Um, and also what she pointed out was this technological similarity with the large areas during the younger dryers where probably they had regular contact and close contact, whereas in the, uh, in the Mesolithic, it is rather that it's more diverse and regionalized. Well, but there we have to say, we looked at the course from the Ahrensbergian in Schleswig-Holstein, Northern Germany, and the concepts made there, that was specifically uh, Mara Julia Weber and Ludovic Mewell, and what they found was a high variability in the Ahrensbergian. So the, our idea of the uh, Ahrensbergian being an semi curating um, technology which have very different assemblages. In that sense, it's, yes, we can confirm this. The assemblages do look very different, but within some of those assemblages, it, the, the behavior of the Ahrensbergian looks extremely expedient. So that we actually see some assemblages where it was really like they just took a stone and just snapped and just did their thing. And other assemblages where they really cared about their, um, their core um, maintenance and other stuff. So yeah, there it, we were like, okay, it's not that easy, especially if you're starting off with kind of um, a group where you have a high variability and not that clear like, oh, this is the Ahrensbergian style of napping. Um, we also had a look at the, the, the typology and um, I just show you, unfortunately, we, we didn't have a nicer picture yet of the, um, uh, the microlithic points that we have from Teltwisch 2, uh, also Ahrensbergian Tunnel Valley, also Ahrensbergian site, and Friesack 27 again. And what you see is a relatively high variability in these uh, lithics, and that, of course, microliths 
appeared in the um, Arensbergian already. And in fact, if you look at when does, we were looking like, when does the, do the first microliths appear? And it seems like um, if you have sites like Remouchamp, or um, if you trust the dates of Zonhofen, um, you have them very, very early on. So the, it seems that uh, they belong to the Arensbergian way of life from the beginning, and also the high diversity of microlithic points. And if you go to the western parts, like um, uh, west of the Rhine, like um, Bel uh, Belgium, um, you actually also ha very often have more microliths when you ha do have tank points. That changes towards the east and towards the north. And so, for example, uh, in our oldest sites in, uh, site in northern Germany that we could date, uh, Altstufenstedt, we don't have a single microlith in an Arensbergian assemblage, but with Nahe, a site that dates approximately to the middle or starts dating to, from the middle of the um, Younger Dries, we also do have first microliths in there. So, you know, the idea of microliths being a boundary for uh, Paleolithic, Mesolithic is clearly not working um, with the Arensbergian part of the world. And also, when we look at the organic, um, the, the development of the organic tools, um, we only see that apparently the fish hook appears in the preboreal, and later on the nets do appear. But that the nets do not, that we don't have nets from the Arensbergian could also be a matter of preservation, so we wouldn't count that too much on that. But um, what we saw in the last years, Daniel Gehorst did a few series, and Markus, I think, helped also with some of the bone points to be dated. And what we found that the idea of you know, typical Mesolithic bone points, they very often dated into the Younger Dryas or even some into the um, Alaro. And um, that this doesn't actually exist, but what we, do saw, what we saw was that there are singular um, types appearing and disappearing in the Paleolithic part, but that in the um, Mesolithic part, the early holo well, uh, developing Holocene, that there was a bigger variety, or not, maybe not variety, but regionalization <coughs> of these points. So we had several points, types, that appeared at the same time, but in different areas. And so if you look at um, everything packed, packed together, you can clearly see that there is no cut at one point. We can see that there are things changing all over time, and it's more like a gradual development of um, how things are going. And um, uh, yeah, how, how things are developing, how they are used, how they are invented. And that um, in the um, Arensbergian, this might also be a reflection of these personal ways of how things do. These different assemblages might also represent different families deciding yeah, I, I want my gear to be very perfectly nice made, and you know, therefore I need to do my core as my grandpa had done the core. Whereas others were like, no, to get my microlith point, I also can do it in a little easier way. So that this already developed in the Arensbergian, and that maybe um, the transition from Mesolithic to Paleolithic is in generally very much overemphasized, and that there is not that clear cut from the um, the hunters of uh, the, the Paleolithic of these wide areas and steppes, in contrast to the woodland uh, hunters of the Mesolithic, that is a little bit too <coughs> short-sighted. It's more complex, the picture. And especially, it seems, in northern Germany, that the final Paleolithic is kind of a complete transitional phase, and not just one cut. We are the transition. So... Yeah, thank you very much. And the dating paper will be published soon in Annabelle's paper. Thank you.